Hello everybody and welcome to this presentation on deep learning. My name is Heli Helskoho and I come from Finland and that's why people know me as Heli from Finland. I have graduated from University of Helsinki with a master's degree in computer science and I'm currently working on my doctoral studies at the same university. I've been working with Oracle products for many many years and uh, data and databases are very close to my heart. I'm a CEO for Miracle Finland, which is a small consulting company in Finland, Oracle Ace Director and Oracle Groundbreaker Ambassador. I have been listed as one of the top 100 influencers on IT sector in Finland for five years in a row. I'm a public speaker. I speak in 10, 10 plus events every year, and I have also written some books. I have written a book about database designing and another one I co-authored with other people about SQL and PL SQL. Currently, I'm working on a, book, on, a, on a book about machine learning. So what is this machine learning? Machine learning is an important part of artificial intelligence. It's a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed, said Mr. Arthur Samuel in 1959. It is a systematic study of algorithms and systems that improve their knowledge or their performance with experience. Some real life use cases for machine learning. Spam filters, lock filters or lock alarms, data analytics, image recognition, speech recognition, medical diagnosis, which is by the way my favorite area, because in medical diagnosis machine learning can be such a big help. For people who live in the area where there's no doctors available, machine learning might be a very uh, good uh, aid for them to, to do diagnoses and for doctors to be able to help them more efficiently, even remotely. And for many, many other areas as well in medical diagnosis. So it's really a great area for machine learning. Robotics, which is very interesting, fraud protection or fraud detection, product, music, movie recommendations, so many different areas where machine learning can be helping. So what is this deep learning? So the traditional supervised machine learning, we have an input. In this example, we have a picture of a car. First, we have to do is feature extraction, which is a lot of manual work. And then after that, we finally give it to the computer to do the classification and sort out if it's a car or not a car. In deep learning, the feature extraction is also done by the computer. So we just send the picture in and we get output. Is it a car or is it not a car? So in general, first of all, machine learning is not a silver bullet. So it's not the solution for any problem you might have in your organization. Uh, machine learning is very useful if it's very complex use cases, something that you cannot program with if and else. So something that has uh, more complex rules, or maybe the rules are changing all the time. And deep learning, as it sounds very easy based on this picture, it is not, because deep learning takes a lot of resources, a lot of time and a lot of data to be able to learn and predict. So deep learning is a solution if you have enough data and enough time and resources to do it. Deep learning could be used with text or voice, like natural language processing or automatic speech recognition. You could transfer text to speech. Let's say somebody who's not able to read uh, could benefit from that. So don't have to be able to read because the computer will speak it to you. Or a speech could be transformed to text and may be given to another machine learning process to be used. Machine translation is very useful for between different languages and maybe a referencing text. So you have a very long article and you just want to know what's the key thing in this article. You could use machine learning to give you the, the main ideas of the article without really reading it. This, of course, raises concerns. What if it's so easy with machine learning? Maybe the next generation will not even learn to read because there's no need to be reading. Well, I hope this is not true because reading is something that we should all know because reading is fantastic. So I was thinking I will ask um, machine learning to write me an abstract. 
So I went to this talk to Transformer and I typed there the basics of deep learning Apex Connect 2020 by Heli Helsgrau and I pressed complete text. And this is what it gave to me. So it, it sounds like it makes sense, but this is total nonsense. So I don't think I could use this as one of my um, abstracts for one of my sessions. So this is two, I pressed the button twice. So the first one is on the left hand side and the second one is on the right hand side. So very interesting uh, abstracts for my presentation. I also went to another web page. Uh, here's the link to that web page and asked what would you give me out if I give you these words? The basics of deep learning at Apex Connect by Heli Helsgraho. And this is the abstract I got from there. So it really can make uh, text, but uh, not sure that it's really what I want at the moment, but quite promising already. And even more text, it actually gave me a very, very long uh, text about my presentation. And what's very interesting is this GOAT app. I have no idea what is my GOAT app and where it came from, but based on those couple of words I just put down, it gave me this kind of interesting abstract. So another way of using machine learning might be translations. So this is just Google Translator. I have written here in Finnish uh, that I'm going to give a presentation about deep learning at Apex Connect event. And what it says in English is Heli will give a presentation on in-depth learning at Apex Connect. So it didn't recognize this special word deep learning. So it, it translated to in-depth learning. So it looks like special words are not known by the translator yet. But I still think that was quite good because it's not easy to translate Finnish to any language. Finnish language is quite complicated. Another use case for deep learning might be recommender systems. The idea of a, rec of a recommender system is that it produces suggestions, recommendations to assist the users in decision making process. There are three different kind of co recommender systems. The collaborative filtering recommender system, which recommendations are based on decisions of other users that have the similar taste as you have. So based on what the other users chose, something is recommended to you. Content-based recommender systems are recommending based on similarities of new items, uh, based on those items that you chose earlier in the past. So if this is a similar item to something you liked in the past. So the recommendation system is recommending that for you. The third category is hybrid recommender systems that are using actually multiple, multiple approaches together. One of these classical examples is Amazon. So I went to Amazon and I asked for recommendations to me. Well, I don't even have to ask. It's already giving me recommendations. Funnily enough, none of these would be interesting to me. First of all, I don't do knitting. Secondly, most of these books are in a language I don't speak. So what would be the point of trying to read them? The reason behind this is that Amazon doesn't know anything about me. I only have my, my uh, author profile in Amazon, so it knows I have written books. And when I was in Tokyo, I was ordering some shampoo and conditioner using Amazon Japan. This is all Amazon knows about it, about me, because whenever I order something, like I usually order books, like you can see, it knows I like books. So when I order books, I usually ask my son to order for me because it's so much easier for me. He handles it and I just get the books. So Amazon doesn't know much about me. And that, that's why it's recommending very strange things to me. So all the base here is that you have enough data. So you have to know what kind of customer we have and what does she like. So in this case, it went totally wrong. I wouldn't buy any of these books. So this was useless for me. But the reason is they don't have information about me. Another very classical example would be Netflix. So here's the recommendations for me. First of all, you can see it's in Finnish. Uh, so they are probably using also uh, machine learning for translations. I'm actually doing a pretty good job. This looks like real Finnish, but it's not really sentences. It's just simple words. So that's probably why it's doing well. 
But the problem here is that it really doesn't know I have seen most of these already. Either on a plane when I've been flying from one place to another, movie theater, from television, or even from Netflix, but very long time ago. So there is not many here that I would really like to see because I have already seen them. Well, my husband says that's fine because you usually sleep most of the time when you're watching something on TV. So you could watch it again because you don't remember it anyway. So maybe Netflix knows that. So they are recommending the same things to me again. But yeah, not very useful to me again. So there are also one third category that is very interesting for machine learning and for deep learning, which is the visual recognition problems, the computer vision. Image classifications, object recognitions, object detection, image captioning, action classification, object or image segmentation. Any kind of things that has something to do with pictures or videos. Here's an example that we have a scenery of many, many things. And the computer is identifying traffic lights, handbag, person, car, and so on and so on. So from many details, it can find something that it recognizes. So I was thinking I will talk a little bit more about pictures because pictures are everywhere. You know, you're in a meeting and then you, you're drawing something on the screen. And somebody says, OK, I will send you that info later. I will write a, a notes about it and send to you and said, no need to. I will take a picture. So there are so many pictures about so many things. And a lot of our data is in pictures. But the question is, how do you get the information out from those pictures? Uh, so it takes a lot of time to train. It takes a lot of computing power. It takes a lot of data. It takes a lot of everything to really understand the pictures. You know, when you are seeing the picture, it takes you a lot of processing to realize what is in the picture. Even when you see it again, you find details you didn't see the first time. So picture contains a lot of information. The basic idea here is that each item is constructed from smaller items. So it's called feature-based object recognition. There's a lot of research from that area already from 1970s. And, um, but there are problems with this, even though you can, you can figure out what's in the picture because different lights, if it's darker, it's lighter, how the light comes to the picture and so on. From different angle, if you're seeing the face directly, from the front, if you're seeing this from the side and so on. What about the colors? If the colors are very bright or light or whatever. So all these kind of circumstances might make it difficult to understand what information we have in the picture. These pictures are in different layers. There's edges and how these edges form shapes like rectangles or circles and how these shapes form particular features like eyes, nose, and so on. Uh, there's a lot of math behind this, and this math was actually already invented a long time ago. We have linear regression, matrices, arrays, neural networks. All of these we already actually had a long time ago. We also have increased computing power. We have the GPUs, graphics processing units, and we have the TPUs, the tensor processing units. That actually makes it very powerful for processing matrices or any of these machine learning uh, items. A very groundbreaking research on object detection was 2001 by Paul Viola and Michael Jones. This is when you are taking a picture with your phone, each face in the picture is marked with a rectangle. That sounds very normal nowadays because even with your phone, you can do that. But 2001, it was not everyday thing. It was a new thing. So most of these things that we see now in, in a deep learning is actually invented on 2000 something. Not the basic math and so on, but all these cool things that make it possible for us to really use deep learning. 
the quality of the pictures has improved a lot and they are in digital format. And also we are able to store these pictures. So we are able to have enough data for the deep learning process. And so much more has happened during the years. We also have good quality data sets uh, since 2006 till 2014 and still all the time improving. So we have data sets that we can use for, for training our network. We can also use transfer learning. So if one of the networks has learned something, we can use that learning for another network, transferring the learning. And we can fine tune a pre-trained model. A very big improvement on the object recognition ac was accuracy was actually convolutional neural networks, CodeNets or CNN. So actually 2012 was a total breakthrough on this with uh, Krzyzewski et al. paper with using GPUs, ReLU, dropout, preprocessing and so many interesting things that made it very usable solution. So 1995, six, seven, even until eight, when Lacan was doing his great work on uh, convolutional neural networks, neural networks were, were thought as not usable at, at all. They were just, they will never work until 1998 or so, it was very popular again. And now it's something that is used in many, many places. So convolutional neural networks uh, work like this. We have an input, the picture of a dog here, that goes to convolutional layers. And after flattening, it goes to a neural network that will do the figuring out if it's a cat or a dog. So the convolutional layer, the first level is filtering. The filter is using kernels, sharpening, blurring, edge detection, and so on and so on. So this is the point where we are doing, uh, uh, you remember the pictures are, our pictures are, are built with smaller pictures that are built with smaller and smaller and smaller. So we have edges, we have rectangles, we have circles, we have noses, we have, and so on and so on. So these kernels are used to find out the nose or a circle or so on. So this is how the convolution works. The yellow here is the kernel, and using the kernel, we do convolutional uh, convolutions to the original image pixels. And um, there are some image kernels, if you are interested to see what kind of kernels, here's a link for that. From that output, we go to pooling. So there's several poolings, but usually there's either average or max pooling that is used. Uh, the average pooling calculates the average value for each patch on the feature map, while as max is calculating the maximum value. So here on the left, we have the original image with pixels. So it takes these four gray ones and takes the biggest one of them, it's six. And here in the pooling on the right side, it's taking six. From the next four, one, seven, zero, nine, and seven, it takes the biggest one, nine. From the pink ones, it takes the biggest, eight. And from the darker gray one, it takes the biggest, which is nine. So this is what happens in pooling. After, so we have several of these layers, 100, 250, whatever number we have. Whatever happens here, we finally want to go to flattening so that we can pass it to neural network. This is what flattening does. So it just makes a matrix to an array. And then we are ready to go to the neural network side. These are fully connected neural networks. A neural network consists of neurons. So there's an input x1 or x2 from the left hand side. It comes to the neuron, it gets a weight, and there's a bias, and there's an activation function. And using all this information, we get the output, the prediction. So the activation function is weight times input plus bias. Uh, there are different activation functions 
But the idea is to determine the output of neural network. We could use a step function. So its output is 1 when value is bigger than 0, and otherwise it's 0. We could use sigmoid. We could use tan sigmoid, a uh, tan function which is uh, similar as sigmoid. We could use linear function. We could use rectified linear units, which is called ReLU. This is very popular as well. Uh, and usually in this prediction problem we had, is it a cat or a dog? We are making binary predictions and using usually sigmoid to make the uh, prediction. Softmax is used if we have multi-class prediction like cats and dogs and horses. Here's a web page if you want to go and see how it really works. This is very, uh, makes it very concrete to understand how it works. A very big part of uh, deep learning is tuning hyperparameters. So first, when you set it up, you just guess some values for all the hyperparameters. But the next job is to find optimal set of them. So what are these hyperparameters? Number of epochs. So how many epochs do we do? One epoch is when an entire data set is passed both forward and backward through the neural network once. So what's what's the patch size? What 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 would be ideal for us as the patch size? So one epoch is divided into several smaller patches. Number of hidden layers, number of units, how many neurons in each layer, what are the weights, what is the bias, what activation function to use, what kind of learning rate or step size should we use, what kind of optimizer to use, and so on and so on. So there's a lot of hyper hyperparameters and tuning those hyperparameters. Backpropagation is the key. In, in neural networks. It's the process for neural network to learn. So first we guess the hyperparameters and we predict. So input comes in, we use the weight and the bias and so on and so on until we get the prediction out. Then we have a loss function. Loss function is comparing our prediction to the true target. So we already know if it's a cat or a dog and we see how lost are we actually with our prediction. We get a loss score. We pass it to the optimizer. Depending what kind of optimizer we have, it, uh, it, way, it updates the weight of the first layer from uh, getting the prediction. So it starts from the furthest one. If, if we think about the picture going inside, we are coming back from the from, uh, output to go through the whole layers reverse. So we update the weight and we see what happens. So here the two important things are the loss function and the optimizer. Loss function quantifies the distance between the predicted value and the real value of the target. So how lost are we? It's a non-negative number and the smaller it is the better it is and if it's a zero it's a perfect prediction. So there's a lot of possible functions available. The optimizer, gradient descent, uh, is an iterate, iterative optimization algorithm for finding a local minimum uh, of a differentiable function. It could be just uh, SGD, SGD momentum, SGD Nesterov, and so on and so on. Adam, by the way, is quite popular. Well, it takes long, demands so much resources. Is it correlation? Is it causality? Uh, maybe there's bias in the data. Like if I put in a translator, in, in Finnish, we don't have he and she, we just have a person. So if I say person is a computer programmer in Finnish, it will translate it as he is a programmer. So I will not get out she is a computer programmer. Or I will not get out he is a nurse, even though in Finnish that's very relevant or very possible. So there's biases in data that will affect things. There's a thing called overfitting when the machine learning model fits the training set too well and the generalization error increases. We could use augmented data for that or we could use dropouts, which means that we just randomly takes one of those, several of those neurons away from the learning process and so on and so on. 
We can also have underfitting, where the machine learning model is unable to reduce the error for either the test or the training set, so it didn't learn enough. We could use transfer learning, the pre-trained network, and uh, the feature extraction is done by those that the previous network already learned, and these features are then run, run through a new classifier, which is trained from the scratch. Another very interesting thing is reinforcement learning. So what we talked so far was deep learning, but reinforcement learning creates its own data. So it's not just doing predictions, uh, but actions to take. There's a link on the, of, of a video how the car is learning to park on the uh, parking area. So the reinforcement learning works in this way. So we have an agent, let's say our car in the parking area. It takes action, it moves car to another position in an environment, the parking lot. It moves to another state in the environment and gets a reward. Either it was a successful move or a horrible move, it hit another car. So this is a good way to learn in the situation where we don't have a car, when we don't have a data. So we don't have data for the car to tell how to park. So it will learn by getting the rewards and learning how to really park. So the problem here is that how do we define the reward function? So how, how do we tell the car how well or how, how badly it actually did? Because the car does not have the basic knowledge of not hitting other cars, not hitting uh, anything in the area and how to find the parking place and just park. So for this car, it takes about 300,000 300, times to really be confident with parking. And I'm sure when you were learning to park, it didn't take so long. So it starts everything from the scratch. It doesn't have the basic knowledge we have when we start learning to park. So reinforcement learning is quite interesting, but is it enough? Because what do we actually want from artificial intelligence? We want to have machines that can learn and think like humans. Um, deep learning with reasoning, the common sense, an ability to learn background information without attaching it to any particular task. Like green color is a green color wherever it is, not just in this one particular task, which reminds me of something. So there was a deep learning model that idea was to know if the picture is of dog or a wolf. And it learned very well. It was very good in knowing which one it is. And you know, it's not very easy to know if it's a, if it's a dog or a wolf because they're quite similar. But this machine learning model was very good in that. Until one picture came. It was obviously a dog, no question about it. But the machine learning model said it's a wolf. And now the question is why? Because it was such a good model, why did it fail? And the reason was that it didn't actually learn dogs and wolves. It actually learned grass and snow. And this particular dog was on the snow instead of grass. So it learned completely wrong thing. And we didn't know it. So what the machine should be doing, it should be curious and make observations all the time to be able to learn better. So it's all about predictions. Here's a nice video. I, I, I highly recommend you watch this. This makes me laugh every time. So the point here is that a magic trick is made for a monkey. So uh, the trainer puts something in a cup, shakes it and opens it. And whatever was inside a cup is no longer in there. So the prediction was that whatever is in there is still there, but it's not. And it was so funny for the monkey to see that the prediction was wrong, that the monkey is laughing like crazy here, as you can see. So everything is based on predictions. So we are predicting whatever was put inside the cup is still there when it's been shaken. So there's a thing called self-supervised learning that might be the next step. So this slide is uh, from Jan Lecon. Um, 
his deck's deck about uh, self-supervised learning. So the idea with self-supervised learning, it's predicting whatever based on whatever. So whatever is missing is predicted what, uh, based on what we know. So we are predicting future from the past or from the recent past or past from the present, top from the bottom and so on and so on. So uh, predict the oculate from the visible. This might be the way to learn uh, better than it, it's doing now. And maybe even the smartest thing would be self-supervised reinforcement learning. So putting together both self-supervised and reinforcement learning. So that might be the next thing happening in the area. But whatever it is, machine learning is here today and in the future, and it is really exciting. And there is so many interesting areas in machine learning to, to learn. So just pick your area and start learning because this will be so exciting to everybody. It's not just for people who like this and that. It's for everybody because it's a broad area. Machine learning is a team play. There's roles for different kind of people and equally exciting jobs for everybody. So this is really super exciting area. Thank you very much for listening. Any questions, I'm happy to answer. Here's my email, my Twitter, and my blog. So please, any questions. Thank you.